So once again, we resume our study of the life of Joseph the Rescuer uh, this morning. Uh, the last time we were here, uh, we learned how to fight against and overcome temptation uh, by looking at how Joseph overcame temptation uh, last week, right? Uh, if you missed that, if you missed the message last week, please take some time to watch it uh, through all the media outlets that we have, YouTube, our website, Facebook, uh, and even through our podcast. So you don't have any excuse, okay? You can't say you missed one because it's right there for you. So please, I encourage you to watch it if you missed uh, any of the messages uh, in this series, in this mini-series. So this morning, what we're going to do is we're going to pick up where we left off last week in our story, okay? So far, uh, we've seen Joseph... Okay, this is from last week. We, see, we've see, we saw Joseph uh, because of his integrity and his high view of marriage, remember? Uh, and uh, his high view of sexual intimacy within the marriage uh, and how much he valued his relationship with God. Uh, we saw how Joseph continuously declined the offers of Potiphar's wife to sleep with her. Uh, and this was day in and day out. So Potiphar's wife fell so much into the temptation that every day she kept trying to tempt Joseph. And Joseph every day kept denying her over and over again. Until one day, when both of them were left alone in the house, Potiphar's wife became more aggressive towards Joseph. And uh, as our story says, and our text says, caught Joseph by his garment. Okay? But Joseph, uh, again, driven by his convictions, and I would say driven by his faith, uh, he fled. He ran away uh, and got out of the house. Uh, but he left his garment behind. Uh, so Potiphar's wife uh, would then later use this garment to persuade her husband that Joseph intended to sleep with her. Uh, but that she denied him. Uh, and called out for help instead. Uh, and according to the story, it seemed as though Potiphar believed every word that she said. And this is where we're going to start in verse 19. Let's read it again. As soon as his master heard the words that his wife spoke to him, this is the way your servant treated me, his anger, Potiphar's anger, was kindled. So now at this point in the story, you can imagine how angry a husband would get if he just heard his wife say that somebody tried to uh, sleep with her. Uh, so at this point, how angry do you think Potiphar was, especially with, with Joseph? Well, um, I like how one commentary comments on this part of the story. Uh, Guzik, David Guzik comments, and I quote, Potiphar knew what kind of a woman his wife was, and he knew what kind of a man Joseph was. His anger probably came because he knew that her accusation against Joseph was not true. Okay? It's interesting, right? Uh, Kidner also comments, death was the only penalty Joseph could reasonably expect. His reprieve presumably owed much to the respect he had won, and Potiphar's mingled wrath and restraint may reflect a faint misgiving about the full accuracy of the charge. So yes, Potiphar was angry. Uh, but it seems like he wasn't angry because of what he heard from his wife. He was angry because his wife, he, she, he might be saying that, uh, she might be giving him a lie because he knew who Joseph was. And if you think about it, right, uh, if you're in Potiphar's position, he is a man of power uh, in Egypt. Yeah, he should have put Joseph to death, but he didn't. Right? After hearing the charges against Joseph from his wife, um, Potiphar came to the conclusion that, hey, you know what? My wife might be lying because I know Joseph. And again, the reason for that way of reading this and, and kind of understanding what happens next is because after hearing the story from Potiphar's wife, or Potiphar, instead of killing Joseph there on the spot, uh, you know, because of the high treason that Joseph supposedly committed against him, according to Potiphar's wife, 
We will see, if you read through it, uh, he didn't. Uh, he sent him to, Potiphar just sent Joseph to, to prison. Um, and again, notice how Potiphar, uh, in the story, um, pretty much came to the conclusion on his own. Uh, throughout all the accusations being hurled against Joseph by Potiphar's wife, nowhere in the text showed Joseph trying to defend himself. There's nothing in this text that showed uh, anything that Joseph said. Joseph was just, just quiet. And I, I, I would think that he was actually there when Potiphar's wife was, uh, you know, saying all these accusations uh, against him. Uh, but he never said a word. Uh, Spurgeon says, and I comment this, uh, Joseph's quietness uh, showed great power. It is hard for a man to compress his lips, saying nothing when his character is at stake. So eloquent was Joseph in his silence that there is not a word of complaint throughout the whole record of his life. Like, you mean, going back to the start, and I mentioned this before, um, we've never heard Joseph complain about his situation. Not once. Uh, not when his brothers threw him into the pit. Not when he was sold as a slave. Um, and not... At this time, when he's being, you know, his name, his character is being dragged through the mud. He's being slandered by Potiphar's wife. Not once did you hear or did we see Joseph say anything to complain nor to defend himself. Now, uh, what can we learn from this part of the story? Uh, so today, this is where we're going to focus on. Um, what can we learn from this part of Joseph's story? I can see two things that we can learn from this part of the story. First of all, uh, we can learn from Joseph's example how to handle slander and gossip. Okay? How, do we, how are we supposed to handle slander and gossip? And second, what we can learn from this story is that doing the right thing in a broken world will almost always result in our suffering. Okay? Doing the right thing in a broken world will almost always result in our suffering, but also will result, will result to our blessing. Okay? Doing the right thing not only results in suffering, it also leads to blessing. So let's start with the first one first. How do we handle, from Joseph's example, how do we handle slander and gossip? Okay? I had to learn this lesson the hard way. Okay? Uh, for most of us, being slandered is something that uh, you probably experience at one point in your life or another. Um, and it, for me, it's something that really gets me upset, okay? It really gets my blood pressure up. Um, and like I mentioned earlier, we've all, including myself, have experienced being slandered or being uh, gossiped about, right? Um, uh, I have been. Uh, <laughs> I've been slandered a few times. Um, and uh, sadly, I would say even more when I became the pastor of this church. Um, don't ask me why. That's a separate sermon. Uh, but as far as being slandered is concerned, yes, we've, I've experienced it. And I know some of you have as well. Now, unfortunately, uh, sometimes um, when, when I hear somebody you know, telling lies about me or slandering my my name, uh, most of the time, and <laughs> most of the time, I just can't keep quiet about it, uh, the way Joseph was in our text. Um, uh, and, and, and I just feel like I had to defend myself uh, when it comes to slander. Um, and the main reason is that, unfortunately, uh, there are some people out there who, unlike Potiphar, will actually believe and listen to slander. Uh, and I just believe it and listen to it, um, even talk to others about it uh, before talking to me first. That's what makes my blood kind of blood pressure boil, right? Uh, so when that happens, when somebody actually lends an ear to somebody who's slandering somebody else, if you lend an ear to it, what happens is like uh, it's, it turns like into the it turns into like the coronavirus. Uh, where this slander would turn into uh, gossip. Uh, and gossip spreads like wildfire, uh, especially if you're in a 
place or you're with others who have itchy ears. Uh, they like to listen to this stuff. Um, so, uh, you know, knowing that, uh, my first reaction is to defend myself. Uh, I feel like I have to talk to these people uh, one at a time if need be uh, in order to put a stop to the slander and therefore put a stop to gossip. And uh, those of you who have been in our church for a while now, you know that this is the first thing that I kind of um, spoke about and preached on when I first became pastor in the church is that gossip got to stop. There cannot be gossip in church. And I've said this over and over again, right? Uh, I mean, and I've said this again over and over again that even in companies, uh, you can get fired for gossiping. So if it's that bad out there, especially it's worse in the church and I can't stand gossip. So when I hear it, it's, uh, not, just, not, the one, not just the ones about me, about any gossip, uh, I tend to, you know, my first reaction is to defend myself or, you know, to try to put a stop to the gossip or the slander that's going on. Now, having said that, um, I think that when it comes to accusations, when it comes to slanderous words or comments, uh, the correct and biblical way to handle them is to be like Joseph and not like me, <laughs> okay? Again, Joseph, in the face of slander and gossip, stayed quiet. The basis of that, foundation for that, is because he trusted God to defend him rather than trusting himself to defend himself, right? Um, when, um, when this was happening, when, um, you know, when, when I hear people, oh, and I hear people telling me, oh, somebody so-and-so said this about you, and I know it's not true. Uh, when I was going through these experiences, um, you know, I spoke to our former pastor, Pastor Luis, um, and one of, our, one of my friends here at church uh, for some counsel. Uh, and guess what they told me? Uh, pretty much the same thing that, you know, that, that Genesis right now is telling us. Um, Pastor Luis told me um, uh, how to handle uh, slander and gossip against yourself was to uh, ultimately uh, trust that, uh, you know, only God and myself know the truth. Uh, and, that, and that, knowing that, is enough. Uh, there's no need to defend uh, myself in front of these other people, uh, however many they are at that point. Um, so that's the, that's the counsel that I got from our uh, former pastor. And um, it rings true uh, to, what the, to what we're looking at right now in terms of Joseph's life. Uh, but for me at that point, when I heard that, when I heard that counsel, I was, that was pretty hard to swallow. Um, First, because of the pride in me uh, that says I shouldn't just let people get away from telling lies about me and that my truth should be heard. Um, that was my way of thinking uh, back then uh, when it comes to handling gossip and handling slander. Uh, but then I realized, you know what, ultimately I have no control over what people say about me or you know, what people believe about what they hear about me. And it goes <laughs> true for everybody else. There is no, we, we have no control over those things. And so even if I were, even if we were to defend ourselves, it's highly unlikely that we will be able to persuade, it, persuade anybody or convince anyone of the truth. Because obviously those people are slandering, they're dishing this out as truth. Uh, even though those of us know what, what the real truth is, uh, you know, no. Uh, so, uh, so it's like truth versus truth is what's going to happen, right? Uh, and so when that happens, it's hard to convince uh, people uh, to, you know, to side with you. And that's not what we're supposed to do. That's not, you know, what we are, that's not, that's not how to fight against slander or gossip. Uh, because in the end, um, again, it really doesn't matter what other people think. Uh, about you, uh, all that matters is what God thinks of me, um, and uh, you know what? God will vindicate in the end. Uh, we have to trust that. We have to trust that if you are the one telling the truth, uh, there's no need to defend yourself 
from slanderers or gossipers. Uh, God uh, is the one who will vindicate you in the end. He is the judge. He is the one who is going to come in the end and say, well, you know, this is the truth. Uh, he's going to do that not just for you, but for everything else. Because he's being slandered every day. <laughs> right? A lot of people are talking about God out there um, as if he's this, you know, uh, you know this, this, this being that's far off or this angry God or this uh, God who, you know, who hates the gays and hates all these people. That's not who God uh, is. He's being slandered every day. And one day he's going to come back uh, and he's going to vindicate not just himself, uh, but everybody else who are... Uh, just like Joseph being uh, slandered um, because they told the truth. Um, and so um, how do you handle uh, slander? Um, it's not by defending ourselves, um, by ourselves. It is trusting God to be our defender. Uh, and again, it's like Joseph, that's what he did, right? The whole time Potiphar's wife was saying all these things about him. He just stood there and, and pretty much took it. Uh, he just stood there and just kept quiet, trusting that God will defend him um, when it comes to the issues or the slander or the gossip that's being dished out about him uh, at that point in his, in his life. Uh, Joseph knew the truth, or sorry, God knows the truth and will reveal it when the time comes in his own way in order for him to accomplish his purpose for your life. Uh, again, we're looking at this story from a point of view where we've seen the whole story. We know how it's going to turn out. And we know where this is going to lead, right? Uh, so even though, yes, Joseph was slandered, Joseph was later on put in prison, we know where that's going to lead. So uh, we know and we can see that God does work, that God does accomplish his purpose, even though, yes, you have to go through suffering first, um, he will accomplish his purpose for your life no matter what. Uh, and again, he's the one who will vindicate uh, those of us who are dealing with this or who have dealt with this uh, when it comes to the topic of or when it comes to the issue of slander and, and gossip. Uh, so yes, don't follow my example when it comes to this stuff. All right, don't let your emotions get the best of you. Instead, Trust God. Trust God to defend uh, you uh, from any slander or gossip. Now, if people come talk to you, that's fine. But don't be taking people's, you know, don't be pulling people aside and be like, oh, you know what, this is the truth. This is my truth. Uh, you should side with me. That's not the right way of dealing with slander. That's not the right way of dealing with gossip. The right way of dealing with it is by faith. Again, that God will vindicate, and ultimately he will avenge uh, when it comes to uh, the issue of slander and gossip. That's the first thing we learn from that verse uh, in verse 19. All right? uh, second thing uh, that we can learn from this part of the story of Joseph is that doing the right thing in a broken world will almost always lead to suffering. Uh, but it also leads to our blessing. We say that again, doing the right thing in a broken world will almost always lead to our suffering, but also to our blessing. First Peter uh, 3, 13 to 17, let's read it. Verse 13, it says, Now who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But... Even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet, do it with gentleness and respect. Having a good conscience so that when you are slandered, uh, not if you are slandered, when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame, for it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. Now, before I continue to unpack what that, 
uh, how that verse or those verses relate to the second thing that we learn from our text in Joseph's life, uh, let me first qualify what I mean by doing the right thing. What does it mean to do the right thing? Right? Doing the right thing, doing, right, doing the righteous thing. Uh, as far as our society is concerned, doing the right thing is having the freedom to do anything that makes you happy and that makes you feel good. Okay? For our society, that's what it means to do the right thing. Um, have the freedom to do anything that makes you happy and that makes you feel good. That's not what I mean when I say do the right thing. Okay? What I mean when I say do the right thing is to be able to do the things that are right and good in God's sight, which ultimately leads to God's glory. Right? That's what I mean by saying, when I say do the right thing. Now, unfortunately, in the world that we live in right now, uh, and sometimes even in the church, doing the right thing in that sense, doing the right thing that pleases God, uh, doing the right thing that leads to God's glory, uh, doing the right thing in that sense is usually perceived as something that is wrong when it comes to our society today, right? It's like, uh, like when I told my kids that Christmas is about Christ, not about Santa Claus, right? That's the right thing to do, right? Because that in God's sight is right and, and righteous, and it brings God glory. Right? Christmas is not about uh, Santa Claus and, and gifts and, uh, you know, um, and toys and all this stuff. It's not, Christmas is not about that. Right? So when I, when I tell my kids that, you know, uh, don't look at Christmas that way. Don't be expecting uh, Christmas to be just about gifts. It's not about that. The whole thing about Christmas, the whole truth about Christmas is the birth of Christ and our hope in him and all that stuff. Some parents come to me and say, why would you do that? You're ruining their childhood. Right? You get, <laughs> that's not exactly suffering, but, you know, you, you, in doing the right thing, people think that, no, that's wrong. You shouldn't be doing that. You, you let your kids enjoy. Let your, uh, you know, kids enjoy their childhood. Uh, same thing when we talk about our kids uh, when it comes to trick-or-treating and celebrating Halloween. We do the right thing by saying, no, we don't celebrate. We don't celebrate that. It's not pleasing in God's sight. It's not glorifying to God what we do in Halloween, celebrating evil spirits and all this stuff. Not the right thing. The truth is this. But when other parents hear that, especially in schools, uh, what do they say? Why are you doing that? You're not letting your Children enjoy their childhood. Just let them enjoy. Just let them, you know, go with the flow, so to speak. Uh, some of people in the church, pretty much, some of them who agree with, you know, that Halloween is this harmless uh, thing, uh, even scold you for that, right? Uh, or uh, when I discipline my kids, when I'm so, when I'm strict with my kids. Um, there was one um, instance where, you know, I was, I was telling my kid, no, no, you're not, you, you can't do this. You're not supposed to do that. Uh, and, my, you know, my son started crying. I, I, I forget it was Eli or Caleb. And some, some of the parents told me, what are, why, why, why are you so strict? Just let them do it. Right? Uh, you know, look, uh, you're making them cry. Uh, you know, pretty much I told <laughs> Pretty much what I said was, well, I'd rather them cry now than they make me cry later when they don't, you know, when they don't see me as, as, as the authority anymore because they won't listen to me. Um, so even when disciplining kids, um, which is the right thing to do, that's what the Bible talks about, that's what God uh, prescribes for us to do, uh, even that, uh, even though it's the right thing, um, it's being perceived as something that is wrong something that we shouldn't be doing. Uh, we shouldn't be too strict with our kids. Uh, um, what else? Uh, in the church, when, you, when we confront uh, a brother or a sister, when we rebuke a brother or a sister, some people don't see that as the right thing to do. Uh, they, you know, some people don't see that as loving. Um, well, uh, you know, we, we study this in men's. That's... Uh, that's the total opposite of what rebuking is. Uh, we, uh, the Bible talks about it, you know, that we're supposed to rebuke one another. Why? So that we can restore and, and straighten out the path that we're, our brothers or sisters are, you know, if, if they're going the wrong way, you have to pull them back the right way. But sometimes that, that takes rebuke, that takes um, 
that takes a confrontation. Uh, but again, um, doing the right thing in that sense will again lead to, um, uh, or it will be perceived as something that is, that is wrong. Uh, and I think that's why, uh, this is one of the reasons why a lot of Christians are hesitant to do the right thing. Uh, because of the fear of the retaliation and fear of the consequences that it could bring. Right? You know, doing the right thing nowadays almost always means going against the majority. Uh, and with it, uh, inevitably, uh, comes suffering. Um, I experienced that at the workplace. Um, when I used to work for the bank, um, I posted this uh, thing on Facebook, um, you know, saying my stand against, against uh, same-sex marriage. Um, and the friends that I had back then on my Facebook uh, account, uh, some of them were managers at work. Um, and once I posted that, uh, you know, my stand against same-sex marriage, uh, the very next day, uh, these same managers had a meeting about me. Uh, and I was told about this by one of my coworkers. Uh, that, you know what, uh, yo, these managers are meeting about you. Uh, it's about something you posted on Facebook. Um, and I think from then on, uh, I was looked at as some, somebody who hates homosexuals and somebody who, you know, who, you know, who, who are, are who's against that kind of uh, thing. And I, don't, I don't love the homosexuals, and, and, and that's not the case. Um, I'm, just, I'm just voicing out uh, what I know and what I stand on that is true and and right uh, but again uh, in the world that we live in um, it doesn't work out that way uh, the people um, you know the, what we see as truth and what we what we see as right uh, is not being seen or perceived by our society the same way uh, and I think uh, for a lot of Christians the, the reason why they don't stand up the reason why they don't voice out um, the truth is because of the fear of the consequences, uh, the fear of the suffering or the persecution that we might and that we will receive um, when it comes to standing up uh, for the truth and standing up for our uh, beliefs. Um, because again, doing the right thing in a broken world almost always uh, come with uh, suffering. So the question for now, the question for us now is this. Uh, what do we do as Christians in this broken world when it comes to doing the right thing? Standing up for our faith. What do we do? Uh, do we just keep quiet? Right? One of the main examples that have been brought up to me is uh, every time the name of the Lord Jesus is used as a swear word. Okay? What do you do? You sit there and laugh at it. I'm guilty of this myself. Um, I don't necessarily laugh at it, or, um, but I neglect it. Uh, I don't say anything. I don't say that, you know what, that's really offensive for me as a Christian, a follower of Christ. Um, you shouldn't say that around me. Uh, I think I've, I've only stood up that way and said, voiced out my, and stood up for my beliefs that way only once. Uh, but you always hear it. Um, now what about the rest of us? What do we do as Christians when it comes to doing the right thing and standing up for our faith in this broken world? Are we supposed to just keep quiet and therefore avoid suffering and persecution? Or do we stand for our principles and beliefs knowing that persecution and suffering will come? Uh, and if so, how are we to handle or are we to perceive Suffering for doing the right thing, uh, or persecution for doing the right thing. How are, how do we handle that? How do we um, how do we accept that? You know, I did the right thing, Lord, but why? How come I'm suffering? Joseph did the right thing by running away, fleeing temptation, but how come? You know, he's suffering. Uh, he's being put to prison. So how do we handle? that. Uh, our answer is in 1 Peter again. Uh, let's start with 2.20. 1 Peter 2.20. 
For what credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is gracious thing. This is a gracious thing in the sight of God. 1 Peter 2.20, keep that in mind. For what credit is it if, you, if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. And then check out uh, 13 to 17 again. Now who is there, uh, 1 Peter 3, now who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled, but in your hearts. Honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. So in first, how, how do we handle Suffering, if we are to stand up for our beliefs, and suffering will come, how do we handle it? First Peter 2.20 uh, says that doing good will, lead to, uh, will almost inevitably lead to suffering, uh, but that this suffering is a gracious thing in the sight of God. How, okay, when you read that, what makes the suffering for doing good an act of God's grace? Why is that a gracious thing? In the sight of God. How is suffering gracious? Uh, our answer is in 1 Peter 3.13. Again, check it out. 1 Peter 3.13. Now who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? Okay? That's a rhetorical question, right? So the answer to that question is obvious. Okay? Who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? Obvious can answer to that question is what? Is there anyone uh, there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? What, is the, what do you think is the obvious answer? There is. Or there's not. Okay. I'm going to argue that the answer to this question, who is there to harm you? Now, who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? I would argue that, um, that there is no one that can harm you. No one can harm you if you are zealous for what is good. In other words, nobody, nobody can harm you if you are zealous for what is good. And I'm going to unpack that later on, okay? It's the same uh, it's the same answer when we read Romans 8, 31 and 35. Check out Romans 8, 31. Romans 8, 31. Okay. Let me look for it in my Romans 8, 31. Oh, there it is. Romans 8, 31. What shall we say to these things if God is for us? Who can be against us? What's the answer to that? If God is for us, who can be against us? Nobody. Right. 35. Romans 8, 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? What's the answer to that? Obviously, nobody. Shall tri tribulation, distress, persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or storm? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Nobody. Right? Same as 1 Peter 3.13. Right? 1 uh, Peter 3.13, again, can we flash that? Who is there to harm you if you are zealous to do, or if you are zealous for what is good? My answer to that is nobody. Um, now, Romans 8.31 and Romans 8.35 makes sense, right? But this 1 Peter 13, the first time you read this, it's like, eh, I don't know if that makes sense because the next verse, the next verse says you should suffer, but even if you should suffer or have no fear of them, right? Uh, so how does Romans, or sorry, how does 1 Peter 3.14, how does the answer to that question be no one? How does the answer to that question be no one if the next verses are talking about suffering and people reviling your good behavior? Let's read 14. 1 Peter 3, 14 to 16. 
But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled, but in your hearts honor Christ as Lord. Or Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. 16. Having a good conscience so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. So again, why would we answer the rhetorical question in verse 13 the same way we answered the rhetorical questions in verse in Romans 8, 31 to 35? My first answer is in verse 14. Okay? 314 starts off with a but. 1 Peter 3.14. But even if you should suffer, okay, usually when you see a but, okay, it's a contrast to what he's saying before. So if he's saying in 3.14 that there is a chance that you're going to suffer, contrast to that is that, um, yeah, nobody's going to harm you, <laughs> right? If you follow the logic, if the but in 3.14 means a contrast to what he just said in 3.13, then logically, if this is the contrast, if it's saying that somebody is coming to harm you and that you're going to suffer for it, that means 3.13 means that the answer to 3.13 is that nobody's going to come and harm you. Nobody is going to come and harm you if you are zealous for good. Right? Uh, the second uh, reason why I say 3.13, the answer to 3.13 is no one, is because at the end of 14, right? at the end of 3.14, it also says that if you suffer for righteousness sake, or in other words, if you suffer for doing good, what does it say there? You will be blessed. Right? You will be blessed. If you suffer for doing good. Right? That's the other reason why 313's answer is that is anybody going to harm you? No. Why? Because even if I suffer, I will be blessed. Right? So what Peter is saying here is that ultimately, when you are zealous for what is good, you will be blessed. And that blessing is far greater than the suffering you have to endure. So when you think of it, the suffering that you will endure when you stand up for what is good, it's not really that bad because it will lead to tremendous blessing. Right? We, are, we studied this earlier uh, in... Uh, Sunday school, right? When the, when the apostles told, uh, when Jesus said to the apostles, uh, you know, it's being possible for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. It's like a camel going through the eye of a needle. The apostles said, uh, so who then shall be saved? Uh, and then Jesus said, oh, what is impossible with man is possible with God. And then the apostles said, hey, Jesus, we left everything to follow you. Meaning that there is suffering involved in leaving things. They left their, some of them left their wives, some of them left their jobs to follow Christ. And if you look at the other gospels, the cost of discipleship, um, there is something that you will need to let go. And there is suffering involved in following Christ. Christ, but what did Jesus say to them? Uh, you, didn't really, you didn't really sacrifice anything. Why? Because I will bless you. Right? How? I will give you a hundredfold in this life and in and, and eternity and, and in eternity to come. That's what Jesus said, right? So even if they think they suffered because they left things, they left their wives, they left their families, they left their jobs, Jesus said, you're not really going to suffer, and that suffering is not really... It's not really that bad because of the blessings that come along with the suffering. Um, Paul, I think, puts it best in Romans 8. Check out Romans 8, 18 and 19. 
Romans 8, 18 and 19. We'll flash for you. Romans 8, 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with what? The glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. Right? Paul says it. There will be suffering in the present time, but it doesn't compare to the blessing that will come when he returns. Again, doing the right thing in the present time will end up, will inevitably, inevitably end up in suffering. If you to stand on your faith, if you're to stand on your convictions in the world that we live in right now, you will inevitably suffer. We will inevitably suffer. But the suffering that all followers of Christ will experience is nothing compared to the glory that is coming and will be revealed to us. Right? What is this glory? Well, on that day that we finally meet Jesus face to face, the glory is for us to hear him say what? Well done, good and faithful servant. Revealing on that day fully and finally and declaring who the true sons and daughters of the living God are. So the pain and suffering that we had to endure for doing good, when that day comes, the pain and suffering that we had to endure for doing good, for doing what's right in this broken world, would seem like it didn't even happen because of the great blessing that we will receive on that day. Right? That's why, again, you go back to 1 Peter 13. Who is there to harm you? Who is there to harm you if you're zealous for what is good? Answer is what? No one. Why? Because even if we suffer for doing good, for doing what's right, the blessings that come with it outweigh the suffering as if it didn't really happen. You can't even compare the blessings that you will receive if you stand up for what is good, if you do the right thing in this broken world. That's why 1 Peter 3.17, it concludes by saying, for it is better to suffer for doing good. If that should be God's will, than for doing evil. And notice that part of it. It is better to suffer for doing good if that should be God's will. So we don't go out there deliberately looking for suffering, talking about, oh, I got to suffer so that I can, you know, get the blessings. That's not what that means. This is, it is God who determines whether we suffer or not or how we suffer uh, and when. That's why when Jesus was asking, was telling Peter, feed my sheep, feed my sheep, feed my sheep. And Peter says, what about him? What about John? Uh, Jesus, what did Jesus say to, to Peter? It's not up to you. How, uh, how John will, you know, will ultimately die and whatever. But for you, right, feed my sheep, do this. Uh, so it is God's will, if it, that should be his will, that we suffer. We don't go look for suffering so that we can be blessed. That's not how we should understand this verse. Uh, but again, what the point of this verse is, why is it better to suffer for doing good? Because it leads to great blessings. Right? Suffering for righteousness' sake is ultimately not suffering at all because it leads to God's tremendous blessings for those who believe. Therefore, what do we do? Let us embrace our suffering, stand up for what is right and good in God's eyes. Why? Because suffering, Romans 5 says, suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope in God will not put us to shame. So even though somebody is slandering you, could lead to suffering, let God be your defender. Trust him to defend you. Uh, 
And if you do end up standing for what's right and you suffer, trust that God's blessings will outweigh the suffering that you will experience. That's what happened to Joseph. Right? Joseph was bold in doing the right thing, even if it led to suffering in jail. That's what happens to him, right? He was bold in doing the right thing, even if it led to suffering in jail. But he was quiet when being slandered, even if that led to suffering in jail. You see that? He was bold when it comes to standing up for what's right, even if he was going to suffer and go to jail for it. At the same time, he was quiet when he was being slandered, even if that would lead him to suffering and jail. Again, I would argue that Joseph acted that way because he knew and he trusted that God would defend him and that God's blessings would far outweigh the suffering that he was going to experience. Now, I'm not saying he knew that at that time, but I'm saying he believed it, trusted it. He trusted God, right? And who does that kind of remind you of? That's a point straight back to the Lord Jesus Christ, right? Right? Jesus was bold in doing the right thing. When he started his ministry on earth, he was bold in proclaiming the kingdom of God. He was bold in proclaiming his deity, that he was the son of God. Even if that meant the cross. Because when he did that, he was slandered, right? When he proclaimed, I'm the I am. Before Abraham was, I am. Right? When he said that, what did the, the Sanhedrin say? What did the Pharisees say? Oh, you're blaspheming. Meanwhile, he's telling the truth. That means he was being slandered. When he was uh, put to trial in front of the Sanhedrin before his crucifixion, same thing. He was slandered uh, by everybody. And not just slandered, physically hurt, slapped, kicked, spat on. Right? But he was bold in proclaiming that, but that boldness led to suffering. But when he was being slandered, when he, he was being slapped, when he was being spit on, did he say anything? No. He was quiet while being slandered as a blasphemer by the Sanhedrin. And that led to the cross as well. Right? So Joseph's life, again, pointer to Jesus' life. Now when we look at our society today, it's the opposite, right? Society today, when somebody's slandering you, be bold in defending yourself. Why? Because the pride gets a hit. Our pride gets a hit when we are proven right. right? Our pride, you know, uh, gets a, a shot of, you know, uh, steroids, so to speak, when we are proven right. So when somebody's slandering you, be bold in defending yourself. So that you'll be proven right. Meanwhile, when it comes to doing good, what? Be quiet. That's how society is. When it's time to do good, be quiet. Why? Because the majority doesn't agree with you. And what's going to happen? Your pride is going to take a negative hit when you stand up for what's right. Why? Because they will disagree. They will oppose you. Sometimes even mock you. That's why when we, when we go by society standards, it's the opposite. Be bold when it comes to defending yourself in slander. And stay quiet when it comes to doing the right thing. Now, my question to you is, which one are we? <laughs> which one is you? Are we bold when doing the right thing and quiet when being slandered? Or are we the opposite? When our character is being dragged through the mud and when others revile us for doing good, let us always remember that one day the judge of the universe will return and will vindicate us and reveal the truth. I hope so. Uh, I hope you have that courage as believers to do that, uh, to stand up for what's right, even though we know it's going to lead to suffering. 
But when we remember that that suffering would lead to tremendous blessings that doesn't even compare to the suffering you will experience, I hope that that will give us courage uh, to stand up for what's right and trust that God will vindicate us on that last day. Let's not be afraid to stand up for what's right and stand up for the truth of God's word, no matter the consequences that awaits us in this broken and sinful world, because this is what separates us from them. Why? Because we, believers in Christ, believe in the truth and have hope that God will make everything right in the end. Are you convinced of that? I hope so. Uh, so that when the time comes, so will the tremendous blessing. For those who endure suffering for righteousness' sake. Uh, that's what happened to Joseph, right? Let's read the rest of our text today. What happened to Joseph after he stood there quietly and took the slander? Why? For standing up for what's right. Being bold to stand up for what's right. What happened to him afterwards? Did he suffer? Yes. Why? Because he was sent to prison. But look what happened. 21. Genesis 39. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. Right? So now, <laughs> Joseph is in prison. Whoever is, a, 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 you know, authority over him, God put him in favor again under that authority. He was given favor by the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison put Joseph in charge of all the prisoners who were in the prison, whatever was done there, he was the one who did it. The keeper of the prison paid no attention to anything that was in Joseph's charge. Same thing that Potiphar did before, right? Because the Lord was with him. And whatever he did, the Lord made it succeed. So again, Joseph, instead of being put to death, was placed in the king's prison. Uh, now, some commentary says that the king's prison is like a maximum security prison that we have today. And so even though Joseph escaped death, there was still suffering. I don't know how prison by itself is suffering enough. Uh, but to, put in a, to be put in a maximum security prison, there has to be some sort of suffering. So what does that say? We, us as believers standing up for the truth, we will never escape. Uh, suffering, that there will be. But again, our hope is that even though we suffer, there is tremendous blessings that come with it and that the blessings far outweigh the sufferings we will experience. So, uh, Joseph was thrown into prison. Some Jewish writers say that Joseph was there in prison for about 12 years okay. before making his appearance before Pharaoh. You know what I'm talking about, right? And we'll get to that next week. Uh, and as we read, uh, as we have read in the, uh, in the 12 years of, in prison, God was always with Joseph. He was preparing him for the next steps and ultimately becoming the rescuer of God's people. Uh, that's where our story ends for today. Uh, next week, we'll take a look at what happened. What happened in prison? Now that Joseph's in prison, how did God bless Joseph in prison? I hope you can join us again next week. But again, let me remind you and, and this verse is right in front of us. Romans 5, 3 to 5. Let's just read it one more time. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So as Christians... Be quiet in slander. Trust that God will be a defender. But be bold in standing up for what's right, even if it leads to suffering because God is faithful and he will bless. He will be faithful to his promises, even in suffering. Amen? Amen. Let's close with a word of prayer.